the administration suddenly came up with a bogus FAA drone ban to try to stop that. Uh, but then when uh, the reporter, Bill Malusian, who's been consistent on border reporting, went up in a helicopter, thanks to Texas uh, Department of Public Safety, um, the administration took down their drone ban. Uh, but that's when they came up with that fake uh, Border Patrol horse agent a whipping story to shift the narrative and get the, the focus off of the large numbers congregating under the bridge on to uh, look at what these bad agents have done. Hey, and welcome back to The Narrative. This is Center for Christian Virtue President Aaron Baer here with our fifth volume of The Narrative. Uh, so excited to be back with you guys. Uh, you know, David has uh, let the, all the popularity of The Narrative go to his head. He's sitting over here in his gold shoes and gold chains and just... I even got a bigger office. Got a, he actually did. That, that is <laughs> That's legit. That is true. In part because we hired a new communications director to bring this in, in line uh, at the that, that David wanted to stick in the closet. I was going to put Mike in the bigger <laughs> oh, <wow>. office. <laughs> and David just really how dare do you know who i am you know i am i am the co-host of the narrative podcast (laughs) you better give me that uh but it is uh we have had uh, a lot of fun uh doing this podcast with you all and we've appreciated uh the feedback we've gotten from you uh, some of you, if, if you heard the uh, the little teaser episode we released last week, you'll know uh, this is going to be a different season uh, for us uh, on the narrative. Uh, we're, we're going towards a, a little bit of a different format in that instead of doing one volume where we take one big idea and unpack it from multiple different angles, uh, we're just going to go, we're, we're going old uh, Jeopardy style potpourri episode by episode where um, whatever topic of the day or, or, or whatever is really raging that we see is a, something that needs to be discussed um, we're going to dive into that. The format will stay the same. We'll, we'll, we'll start off with a, a, just a, a conversation about the news of the day and all those big things, but then we'll have different experts on, different guests um, for the second part uh, on a wide range of topics. Uh, and a good uh, example is the one we have today uh, with Laura Rise from the Heritage Foundation uh, talking about uh, really how the, the broken immigration policy uh, we have uh, in America today is allowing for so many drugs uh, to to flow into the country, and and I'll say too, this is j- just a little aside. This was one of the reasons I- I'm so excited to talk about this issue. One because it's an issue I don't I don't know a ton about. Right, this isn't an issue that that I, I would consider myself um, a, an issue expert over. Right, you want to talk about abortion policy, you want to talk about family policy, you want to talk about religious freedom. Those are things I've worked on for, for, for years. This is not an issue I've, I've had a ton of experience on, a little bit at the attorney general's office, but um, I'm so excited we get to talk about it at CCV because, you know, when I came into CCV six years ago, we were citizens for community values, right? And we were a social conservative organization and we were life, marriage and family and religious freedom. Those were our issues. Um, and I just felt a real conviction that we're going to become a Christian public policy organization, not just social conservative. Um, and, you know, a big part of that conviction was uh, I wanted to not feel pressured to uh, only talk about uh, – I, I wanted to, first and foremost, rightly align our priorities under the authority of Christ, right? We, we wanted to proclaim his name. That, that, that felt really important to me about this work and say, listen, you know, even more important than government and policy uh, is the, the name of Jesus Christ being proclaimed. Um, but also, too, I just felt really convicted – uh, that we ha- as Christians have kind of compartmentalized ourselves when it comes to policy. We have our sacred, we, ha- we have our, our, our moral issues that we speak on, and then there's all this other fiscal and immigration and all these other things that those aren't really Christian issues, right? And I, that's such a wrong way to look at life. That the, the, the light of the gospel shines on everything and brings wisdom to everything. Some things it's really clear on, um, like, you know, don't kill unborn kids and, and, and you know, God has a, a design for a sexual ethic. Uh, other things it just provides wisdom uh, on. Uh, and, and I think on economic policy and on immigration policy, it does too. Um, and so at CCV, we're never going to be afraid to talk on any issue, right? There are certainly issues that we think we feel particularly called to. Um, but it's, I don't know, David, you've probably seen this before where we, we have some for some reason accepted this lie that there's some things that aren't a Christian issue, right? You know, it's it stems from a lack of knowledge. Like I just even working with the marijuana piece, you know, with this drug policy thing, you know, you tend to want to tag uh, drugs on gangs and cartels. Yeah. Right. That's that's not a public policy thing. And I think in most people's understanding 
Well, in this last year, working on the public policy side of drugs, it is a policy issue. Yeah. I mean, it. there are some folks complicit in suits and ties, what I call white-collar dope dealers. Yeah. Uh, with them in the room, uh, well, you want you want to feel a bunch of uh, <laughs> uh, wealthy white collar guys lobbyists get really uncomfortable. Have David come up and call them dope dealers. And I'm, I'm all about youth and families, and and I'm all about carrying you know crusading for Christ, really. And 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 when I see an issue that kind of hits that vein, then then my, I get passionate. And so yeah, it's not just the dope dealers, it's not just the gang members. Um, literally with the marijuana, they're. They're going before the Senate just asking for regulations, you know, to be uh, relaxed so that they can compete with the black market. I just never saw it like that before. And I don't think yeah. most people see it like that. And so hopefully today um, on on the podcast, they will. Well, and I think, David, to that to that point, I think what what you see, especially and this kind of goes into what I wanted to talk about in, in, in our, our first part uh, today. Um, you know, if if I'm, you know, our political opponents and I see the show of force that uh, our, our pro-life friends all across Ohio and CCV and the March for Life uh, showed yesterday. Amazing. Outside, the, you know, I had one lawmaker tell us it was the largest crowd they ever saw at the state house. Um, you know, if I saw that, I would too try to do everything I can to keep groups like CCV and Christian voters um, as isolated on as few issues as possible. That's right. Right. Imagine, though, if the body of Christ uh, stood up for righteousness in all things um, and was willing to say, hey, listen, actually, uh, there is wisdom from God's timeless word to be applied here to. There is a right and a wrong thing um, on drug policy, on all these things. Um, and uh, and and that's, you know, really uh, for CCB, that's what we want to do. That's why we're excited to talk about Laura. Uh, but I want to talk real briefly, yeah, though, March, about man. this March for Life we did yesterday. <laughs> if if I'm, you know, our political opponents and I see the show of force that uh, our, our pro-life friends all across Ohio and CCV and the March for Life uh, showed yesterday. Amazing. Outside, the, you know, I had one lawmaker tell us it was the largest crowd they ever saw at the state house. Um, you know, if I saw that, I would, too, try to do everything I can to keep groups like CCV and Christian voters um, as isolated on as few issues as possible. That's right. Right. Imagine, though, if the body of Christ uh, stood up for righteousness in all things um, and was willing to say, hey, listen, actually, uh, there is wisdom from God's timeless word to be applied here to. There is a right and a wrong thing um, on drug policy, on all these things. Um, and uh, and and that's you know really uh, for CCB that's what we want to do that's why we're excited to talk about Laura, uh, but I want to talk real briefly yeah, this though March, about man. this March for Life we did yesterday, <laughs> uh, and it you know it's one of these things you, you, we started planning this about a year ago the National March for Life Jeannie Mancini and her folks uh, came to us and said hey we want to do a state march uh, in Ohio, uh, and we said yeah let's let's do it we we had this. Again, it was about a year ago, we pulled together all the different pro-life groups, never seen so many life groups come together for a lunch, about you know, uh, uh, about 40 different groups came together um, in, in Columbus to, to say, hey, we wanna do this, would you guys do this with us? Um, you know, I actually think, David, the key wasn't that CCV pulled them together, the key was we bought City Barbecue for lunch that day and fed them. <laughs> and <laughs> might have had something And to then do. they showed up, know. right? That, yeah. that, if people had just the thought Whatever about barbecue, <laughs> right? But then uh, we promoted it, and a lot of folks stood up, and we had what four to five thousand people there yesterday. Yeah, it, was, um, it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, dozens of perfect weather day, all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, David, as, as you're walking away from that, as you're thinking about that, what what jumped out to you on that day? You know, one one of the things that we pray, you know, we pray every day. One of the things that come up often is a phrase, "Lord, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this work." Mm-hmm. Um. It is work. It's hard work. But days like yesterday, just so beautiful. The weather was beautiful, but the people were beautiful. The the culture, the climate was beautiful. Um, it was celebratory. It was it was Lord, thank you. You know, for fifty years of answer prayer and um, uh, you know, seeing the diversity in age, diversity in race. I marched with a couple that was over seventy years old. I marched. With so a gray you, so you went woman. to high school with them? Shut up, man. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to talk about what God did, man. Are you in here playing, man? This is what I'm trying to say. I'm crying and everything. Yeah. This woman was 90 years old, <laughs> yeah. man, and yeah. um, and was walking strong. And 
uh, there was no way in the world she was going to miss that opportunity to say thank you to her God. A woman I yeah. know is a, is a hardcore pro-life warrior. I mean, she started me. One of my first assemblies in schools 20-some years ago, she started me on the grind. Um, just when I gave her a hug to say goodbye, she just hugged me. I mean, I, you know, I thought she was going to break a rib. She, <laughs> uh, just, just saying how thankful she was to see that crowd, literally four to 5,000 people. You know, when I see these clowns in the media say, you know, there was hundreds there. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> Te- technically like, accurate. Hundreds serious? on hundreds. But there's probably a more efficient way to, to describe the crowd than hundreds, right? <laughs> yeah, it was it was amazing. Man. Yeah, no, it, it, it was great. And, uh, and, and it was, you know, even to, as always, with all things pro-life, um, we, we heard reports from from some of the Capitol Police about how, uh, you know, at, about 30 minutes after the march was done and people dispersed, the, the place would look like almost Spotless. nothing had happened. Like it was it was incredible. Um, and and, you know, friendly people like just just God honoring people uh, that, that care about our community and care about our neighbors. Um, and uh, it, it was, you know, cannot thank the March for Life enough, cannot yeah. thank Ohio Right to Life and Right to Life Action Coalition of Ohio and you know, Ohio Christian Alliance and the Ohio Catholic Conference, so many folks. And I'll tell you, I know we have folks all over the states, all over the country uh, doing this. The the National March for Life is now doing these state marches. So, um, you know, I know Virginia, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, uh, California are doing them. I know they're talking about going to Arizona next. Um, No matter where you are, you need to reach out to the National March for Life. Say, hey, come to our state and do this um, and, uh, and work with them. If I could throw in one more thing. So several groups came out. I was sitting with one particular and, and one guy, young guy, was like, you know, what what is the real purpose of a march like that? And we just kind of start kicking around some thoughts. Um, but an event like that supersedes the influence of the media. Yep. Right. The, the only thing they can do with an event like that is suppress it yep. in the media. But, you know, when you have thousands of people coming out, thousands of people tweeting, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever y'all using out there. Um, you know, how do you silence, you know, a voice like that? Um, Students for Life was out there thick. Yeah. And um, uh, you had, you know, I mean, just everybody was there. It, it was amazing. Law, you know, the it's not even a session day. Right. We had, you know, lawmakers stacked up on stage. You know, yeah. it, it was beautiful. No, and, and honestly, though, David, that's the like, I think we talked about this on the, the, the episode we did on the New Yorker piece about us. Um, where you know, obviously we don't, we don't revel in the fact that they they call us names and attack us and all this, um, but but at the end of the day, you know, I don't care so much what the New Yorker does because at this point now the folks have so started tuning out mainstream media, we have a bigger reach with the people we care about than. And when I say the people we care about, the people that we are actually trying to move to go vote. Yes, trying right? to get to rise up. Trying to get to rise up. Trying to, like, we, we, we care about passing bills at CCV, right? That's We, we want to do that, right? And so, you know, we have specific people we're trying to be uh, strategic and reaching to move. And quite honestly, they don't listen. They don't read the New Yorker anymore because the New Yorker has got, they, they don't read the dispatch. They don't read the, you know, listen to NPR anymore because they've gone so far left. And so we're able to just directly reach folks with things like the march, with honestly things like this podcast. Um, like that's the reason why we're doing it is is where it's it's just gotten far past time where we need to start building our own institutions to be reaching people. Um, you know, it's it's why you see you know we're not quite the Joe Rogan podcast. We'll be there soon if David starts to you know get his Joe game Rogan. together. Uh, we'll have a bigger reach than Rogan <laughs> uh, just in time. No, but uh, but but it is like it, it's it it is. The, the, the reality is we, we marches like that give us the opportunity to reach people. The other thing they do too, though, is you cannot separate the National March for Life from the overturning of Roe. Um, the, the momentum, yeah. the energy, you know, just especially like you said, David, doing any type of cultural work is hard. Pro-life work is especially hard. It's a grind, um, whether you're on the pregnancy center side or you're on the lawmaking side or, or wherever you are, it's a grind. And that time of coming together and building each other up and yeah. and praising God together, um, man. That, the momentum, yeah. from yesterday, right? I mean, because we're not done, right? That you know, Dobbs, you know, that was a great yeah. case. Rose overturned. It's come back to the states now, yeah. but um, the work is is in front of us and it's huge. And so when you've got the legislators out there, uh, you know, um, you know, I always when I'm running around the churches, I always tell them, listen, legislators listen to three things. They listen to money. 
They listen to moral compass, you know, hopefully, and they listen to the multitude. And when that many people show up on this issue and uh, in the in the atmosphere that was created yesterday, that is critical. What a way for the body to rise up, be seen, be heard. And to honor these pregnancy resource centers like that, I mean, I talked to several directors, and they all felt like that day was for them. And it Uh, was for them, you know, to celebrate the great work that they've been doing. I mean, my heart just, I was just over overflowing with with joy and and gratitude, Um, especially at a time where you've got, you know, city councils dumping millions of dollars into this this new abortion tourism industry, like sending folks to Indiana and California. You know, we got twenty seven thousand dollars, you know, basically just to, to to scare and prank call PRCs. You know, man, what a day yep. for them just to be blessed and not to have to worry about the fight, you know, the politics, yep. the prank calls, but just to be all there around family and just yep. saying thank you. And, and no, they're oh not alone. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is what pregnancy centers are going. I mean, I, we just got a call. There's things going on up at Bowling Green now in Ohio, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, er, across the, the, the country. Uh, if you have, you know, quite honestly, pro-abortion liberal forces on your city council, there's these model policies that they're bringing in to uh, either intimidate pregnancy centers, uh, like you refer to, the city of Columbus sent twenty six thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars to um, NARAL Pro Choice, a five hundred one c four, a political organization to investigate pregnancy centers. I've never seen anything like this. Um, and and again, what they're going to come out with is, hey, they're serving women. Can you believe this? These evil people. Yeah. Um, and, and that 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 level of attack that that's getting worse and worse. And so one brings forth. There, there's one other thing though um, that that yesterday really did, and it's the reason why we're going to be doing this every year, right? Gotcha. We're gonna we're we're gonna do this march again next year and the year after and the year after um, because it's not only is it a great show of force to lawmakers that the pro life community is here. Uh, not only is it a great way of bringing the body together and bringing people together to celebrate uh, and feel supported, um, but I want to go to you know one of my favorite uh, passages in, in Deuteronomy um, that that we have up on our uh, on our our doorpost at home uh, in our mezuzah. Uh, it's it's the Shema from Deuteronomy six. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart. The next verse, though, is why we do this. You shall teach them diligently to your children, mm-hmm. and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down uh, and when you rise. Um, I, we had so many schools come out and bring uh, their kids <laughs> to be a part of this. I mean, from literally uh, schools, Catholic, evangelical schools from all over the state busing their kids in. They are, you know, Students for Life was there, as you said. They're the biggest reason why we're doing this is uh, we need to, this this movement for life um, has to be passed down to the next generation. Sure. Uh, and events like this, um, celebratory, well-executed um, events like this um, are what uh, are give us an opportunity to, to, to disciple the next generation in this. Um, and what, what could that have meant to Alveda King, right. 70 some years old, you know, pro-life warrior, seeing all those young people yeah. get out of school. Yep. Take that time. Right. And and uh, and just to hear the words that she had to speak, the wisdom that she spoke, um, the hope that she spoke, um, you know, just on that stage was just packed with hope. Oh, yeah. You know, what It was just packed with hope. Yeah, and, and even, like, bringing my girls there, like, just for them to, we took our, 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 our oldest out of school, and, and um, we, because we want her to see this. We yeah. want her to see uh, this is what it is to, to stand for, for justice and, honestly, to be an American, right? Uh, to, to be in a country where we can do these types of things, where we can shut down city streets and march uh, for, for That's justice. what I was telling them as the kids were coming out from, I mean, young to teenagers. Yeah. I'm like, guys, we shut this down for you. Yeah. Like you own High Street, right? Right, that's the... <laughs> yeah, my, they my just daughter, they smile from ear to ear. She asked me, why, why aren't we walking on the sidewalk? I said, because we're, we, we're shutting down the street to send the message that we care uh, about protecting life and yeah. we care about women and we care about families. Um, so, so much more to unpack on that. And we, we definitely will here. Christian business owners today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. As corporate America and chambers of commerce all pray to woke capitalism, 
Christians in the marketplace need an advocate to protect their First Amendment freedoms. As Ohio's only Christian Chamber of Commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to ccv.org slash cbp. That's ccv.org slash cbp. We have a very special guest with us. Laura Reese is here from the Heritage Foundation. She is the Director of Border Security and Immigration Center at the Heritage Foundation. She has over 26 years experience in the immigration and homeland security arena. Uh, She's also worked in the private sector as a homeland security industry strategist and in government relations uh, and in the legislative branch as counsel for the U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on immigration and claims. Laura's writings and work has appeared all over the media from Fox News to Roll Call and The Hill. Uh, she's on radio and TV, and now she can add the narrative, a big big, big uh, a peak for your bio, having the narrative podcast uh, on air. Laura will also uh, be here in Cincinnati with us, um, in, in Ohio with us in Cincinnati uh, for an event uh, that we will be uh, really rolling out all the details on uh, today and tomorrow from uh, from CCV uh, on uh, uh, on this issue, we're bringing her in. It's got, the event's going to be called Cartels and Cornfields, uh, talking about how broken uh, border policy has hurt Ohio. Um, we're going to be doing this in, in Cincinnati. Uh, event will start um, uh, a reception from six to seven and then program from seven at eight thirty. You can go to ccv.org to get that information on this October 26th event. Uh, but more details on that, Laura, later. Laura, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Laura, I, I guess let, let's just start with some context uh, here. You know, can you give us a, a sense of how bad actually are things at the border uh, right now for our country, especially our southern border? Yeah, the uh, the southern border is wide open uh, due to this administration. It is hitting a number of records, and unfortunately, all of them are bad. Uh, whether it is the number of apprehensions by Customs and Border Protection just this fiscal year, uh, they have exceeded 2.1 million illegal alien apprehensions, and they still have a month to go of data for this fiscal year. Uh, Whether it is the number of unaccompanied alien children crossing the border, that's also hit a record. Uh, The number of migrant deaths has hit a record. And of course, the uh, number of American deaths due to drug overdose has also hit a record. Uh, Over 107,000 Americans died in the 12 months ending January of 2022. So all of these records are awful. And it is because this border is wide open that um, we say every every state is a border state, every town is a border town because both the people and the drugs uh, come to all of our communities. So let's dive into a little bit when you say, you know, talking specifically about this this administration's policies, you know, what were the big shifts that when the Biden administration came in, what what did they change that that really allowed for our, our, our nation to have such a porous border at this point? Well, it was several and it was fast um, and it has been overwhelming. Uh, One is stopping the construction of the border wall system. And uh, people have hopefully seen, though this administration has put a media gag order out, um, which, you know, unfortunately, a lot of Americans aren't getting enough information. A media uh, gag? What's a media gag order? They're telling the press not to cover this? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and they're just self-censoring or they're threatening lawsuits or... They are, they're complying. Um, <laughs> and, you know, to get a little bit off topic, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, a, a year ago in the fall, when uh, 15,000 migrants were um, congregating under the Del Rio International Bridge, uh, Fox News was using drones to um, capture the, the video of that and reporting on that. The administration suddenly came up with a bogus FAA drone ban to try to stop that. Uh, But then when uh, the reporter, Bill Malusian, who's been consistent on border reporting, went up in a helicopter, thanks to Texas uh, Department of Public Safety, um, the administration took down their drone ban. Uh, But that's when they came up with that fake uh, Border Patrol horse agent uh, whipping story. 
to shift the narrative and get the, the focus off of the large numbers congregating under the bridge onto uh, look at what these bad agents have done. The second example, more recent, is um, Martha's Vineyard. So you actually had mainstream media go up to Martha's Vineyard to report on the 50 illegal aliens that were uh, transported there. And that is why with in 48 hours, you had the, that group of 50 removed from the island and sent to a, a military base away from the cameras. Wow. Wow. So sorry. That, that, that's again, we, 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 uh, that, that was a rabbit trail there, but um, uh, th- those types of things we talk all the time. We, we just had our big March for life here. And, and of course the media cover says hundreds of people there when we had four to 5,000 people there. Um, we, we see that type of spin in the media all the time. Um, and and obviously it has massive implications on something like border policy. But you were you were unpacking what what were the policies that the Biden administration had changed? Sorry about that. No problem. So the the border wall construction, he halted that right away. He said not one more mile under his watch. Uh, that stopped not just the wall going up. Uh, and you you'll see. And I I was just down in Arizona three weeks ago, and I saw the piles of materials that were to be used for the wall just lying on the ground. Um, But also, uh, it's a wall system. So that includes access road, it includes lights, sensors, and other technology. I saw, as as far as I could see, um, cement stubs that were supposed to be the lights. So the Border Patrol put the wall up first, and then the plan was to come back and install the lights and the sensors and the other technology. And so um, all those lights or future lights have not been erected, uh, nor the sensors that would go on them. And so uh, Border Patrol's flying blind in those areas um, and, you know, wide open portions of the border where cartel members are sending uh, migrants and drugs across at will day and night because... Um, such large numbers of illegal aliens are crossing, they know, the cartels know that Border Patrol agents are having to go process them into the U.S., and we need to get into that a little bit more, um, opening up great swaths of land for then the cartel to send the drugs through. Um, so the wall system, stopping that was one. Another was stopping uh, what's what's informally known as the Remain in Mexico program. Formally, it's the Migrant Protocol protection or protection protocol. The, this is something that Congress passed back, to, back in 1996, but no president ever used until President Trump. And the notion is that if you cross to the U.S. over a land border um, and apply for asylum, you can be sent back to that country, and in this case, we're talking Mexico, to await your asylum proceedings. Um, And he implemented that because uh, caravans of thousands of illegal aliens were coming up through Central America and Mexico, and then they're coached at the border to say a few words of fear, because that would be their ticket into the U.S. and disappear into the interior. So once they learned that they were not going to get released into the U.S. to disappear, but would instead have to wait in Mexico, those cartels stopped coming. And so right away, the Biden administration stopped enrolling new people into the Remain in Mexico program and eventually dismantled the program entirely. Um, I'll I'll mention one more that they stopped that was key. And again, this has to do with asylum. And this administration is really abusing our asylum system and the law. Uh, Asylum is about protection. It's about saving lives. And... um, there's a a concept in the law that you are supposed to apply for that protection in the first safe country in which you arrive. You're not supposed to traverse multiple countries and then, you know, basically country shop for where you want to apply for asylum. And that's what many uh, migrants do. They just want to come to the U S largely for economic reasons. Most of them are not eligible for asylum because they're not being persecuted at the hand of the government on their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion or membership in a particular social group. And so the Biden administration had implemented this, what's called safe third country, which is you have to apply for protection in the first safe country in which you arrive. And if you don't, and then come to the US, then we sent you back to that first safe country and said, you need to apply for asylum there. And once we did that, many of them said, never mind, I'm just gonna go home. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, the Biden administration stopped that as well. And uh, we're, we're seeing the results. And now the administration and the media labels everyone coming here across the southern border as asylum seekers. And they're just encouraging more asylum fraud, which um, no one should be for. And it, it really hurts the, the truly persecuted whose applications are lost in the uh, 8.5 million cases that are pending at USCIS. Laura, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot in the news right now about, um, you know, migrants that have been apprehended in border states being transported, you know, to Martha's Vineyard, uh, to New York. Uh, different places like that. And, and folks are saying, you know, that kind of morally apprehensible, but you know, really you should have to bear the consequences of your policies, right? If you're, uh, if you're a sanctuary city, um, well, then this is where we should have just like from the border directly, uh, they should have just come here and they should have to pay for that, matter of fact. But um, we, it's very clear uh, that we're trying to make them have to bear the burden um, of their policies. But with the drug piece, um how how can we show the average person um, how the drugs that are coming over the border directly affects us in the Midwest, right? Like, so how how much fentanyl have you all recovered uh, just like in a year? Like, how is there a number on that? Like, how how much has been apprehended? Uh, well, the administration has been touting that uh, over eight hundred pounds of fentanyl has um, per month was seized in twenty twenty one which was double the seizures of 2020 and quadruple those of, of 2019. Uh, but that's not the win the administration thinks it is. Uh, one, because that's just what was seized. That's right. um, when we know there's been a million gotaways or aliens who were not apprehended by the border patrol. Um, and we see camera footage, game camera footage of military age men in head to toe camo, camouflage, carrying very full backpacks day and night, um, crossing the border. Uh, those are the gotaways. We have to assume those backpacks are full of, of drugs and, and other bad things. Um, and so what the administration is, is um, tapping, you know, patting themselves on the back over is a drop in the bucket. Right. And um, right. it is, you know, those, those fentanyl pills, um, or disguised as, as other medications that are coming into our, they, they might think they are taking a different type of pill um, and it might be laced with fentanyl. But Even um, candy now, right? Like candy. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We are now seeing rainbow fentanyl right. and they look like sweet tarts. Um, and I am very worried about that with, with Halloween and trick-or-treating coming up. I mean, the New York DEA just seized 15,000 rainbow pills in a Lego box for distribution. Uh, Connecticut just seized um, a similar number, 15,000 pills, about disguised as candy in Nerds and Skittles packages. Um, so this is really dangerous. And the White House is nowhere to be found. Um, the, the DEA administrator, uh, Ann Milgram, she's a political appointee by this Biden administration. She's out there um, talking about this, warning about this. But honestly, she's a party of one. Where is the White House major event on this issue, bringing in experts and coming up with real plans to not just throw money at it afterwards? You know, rehabilitation is important. How do you prevent it in the first place? Yeah. But they don't do it because that means acknowledging a wide open border and they just won't go there. And, and if I remember, Laura, I remember in 2018, we had a, a, a ballot issue in Ohio that was, uh, you know, it was something that Mark Zuckerberg and I remember it was like 90 percent of the money to fund it came out of California uh, to, to decriminalize drug possession in Ohio. And I, I'm going to get the, the, the stat wrong, but it's something like a. Fentanyl of about the size of a dime is enough to kill dozens of people, right? So when you hear hundreds of pounds of fentanyl were seized per month, yeah, like that. That's this is this is not like uh, uh, any other drug where you know, yeah. like just it, it just takes a very little bit to 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 kill someone, yeah. right? It's, it's three grains of salt can kill a person. Um, so tiny, tiny amounts. This is extremely lethal, more than any other drug. And so when we're talking about seizures of hundreds of pounds, then yes, you're killing large 
large populations of people. Yeah. I want to I want to kind of go back on some of the things you talked about with with the border wall and, and just do a little bit of myth fact uh, with you on this, Laura, because uh, and again, this Laura Reese from the Heritage Heritage Foundation with us. Um, you know, let's just talk about the border wall real, real quick, um, because, you know, the, the border wall is one of those things that the media will often mock um, and say, oh, you're going to build a you're going to build a wall and then they're just going to use drones or they're going to dig tunnels and it's not going to do anything. Border walls are it's, it's ineffective. It's a waste of money. Um, what what do you say to that? What, what's what's the, the response to, to something like that? My response is always talk to the agents. What do the agents say that works and what do they need? And it was the Border Patrol agents who asked for this wall. This wasn't a Trump creation. Uh, and at no point have the agents said we need wall from you know the, the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. They asked for a wall system in specific places. And that is what uh, President Trump was uh, trying to get them. Um, can you build a tunnel underneath? Sure. You can send a drone over. You can put a ladder up and climb over. But that is very small numbers. What a wall system does is it slows down um, would-be crossers and it allows Border Patrol to, one, know what's coming, know what's crossing, and respond to it. Um, and, you know, again, it's it's the access road as well as the lights, it's the sensors. So they can, Border Patrol can tell are we seeing humans crossing or are we seeing movement of animals? And that way they can direct their resources accordingly. So walls work. Um, we're reminded that, you know, when when uh, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, erects a wall around uh, Congress to uh, keep people out or when uh, President Biden builds a wall around his Delaware beach home. Um, and so it's it's hypocrisy, you know, yeah. which is pretty common with the left. The other thing I want to talk to you about, going back to what you were talking about with the policies that that the Biden administration uh, changed from the Trump administration, uh, and this is one you know obviously at Center for Christian Virtue we talk a lot with churches, we talk a lot with with, with Christians, um, and there were were many folks in the church that would talk about how the the Trump administration's border policies were inhumane, and we weren't loving our neighbor, and we weren't loving the stranger. Um, with with their policies, but the again, I, when when I was in the Arizona Attorney General's office, um, this was something we we actually saw quite a bit that the Obama administration this was under the Obama administration policy, um, their policy of just get over the border, say asylum, and you're in, um, was was actually hurtful to uh, the the desperate folks, folks in in maybe not great situations, but certainly not you know not asylum typically asylum worthy situations. It was actually dangerous for them in Central and Southern America countries because our policies were incentivizing dangerous trips, dangerous journeys. Um, you know, can you talk about, uh, you know, even just from caring for these actual migrant people in other countries, how the 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 Biden and Obama policies on immigration actually harms them uh, and makes them puts them in more dangerous situations? Right. Well, having open border policies encourages more people to cross illegally. And no one's crossing the border illegally without going through cartel. The cartels have operational control over the border. And the cartels are the worst of the worst human beings. So regularly, women and children are being raped. Uh, they're very dangerous conditions. And that is just on the southern side of the border. But then once on the northern side of the border, many of these people are then put into trafficking, sex trafficking. Um, and also the left, a key aspect of this has been the unaccompanied alien children. So back in uh, 2000, um, California Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein and uh, California Representative Zoe Lofgren had introduced a bill the Unaccompanied Alien Children Protection Act. I happened to be working on the Hill at the time. And when I read that bill, it was very clear that all that would do would, it would be to incentivize more parents to send their kids across the border unaccompanied because it showered those unaccompanied children with immigration benefits because they crossed unaccompanied. Um, and so it would give them a guardian ad litem and taxpayer expense, easier access to immigration attorney, 
uh, faster route to get a green card or a special ju juvenile visa and or um, asylum like uh, immigration benefits. And so clearly it was an intent to have these kids get a foothold in the U.S. and then have their family join them uh, for family reunification in the U.S. So they, they introduced that bill every Congress. It didn't pass, didn't pass. Then in 2008, the Trafficking Victims um, Protection Reauthorization Act, which was considered a must-pass bill, was managed by another Californian, uh, Harold Berman. And he said, put your Unaccompanied Child Act into this trafficking bill and it will pass. And sure enough, that's what they did and it passed. And you can look at the numbers. Ever since 2008, the number of unaccompanied alien children has just skyrocketed. And then you have these same members say, well, uh, you know, a few years later, we have to give green cards to people who came here as a child um, because they came through no fault of their own or, or what have you. Um, but yeah, that's how you designed it. So it is very perverse. They are building an, our immigration system on the backs of children. And then this goes hand in hand with the asylum, which, you know, gets, gets more to your question of encouraging people to come, labeling them all as asylum seekers when we know um, no, most are just coming for economic reasons. They'll admit as much uh, to reporters uh, near the border um, and maybe even to the border agent on the first interview, but they are coached then. Um, to say words of fear, and eventually they, you know, they may apply for, for bogus asylum. Um, but then those who are truly persecuted um, have to wait years to have their claims adjudicated and to get on with their lives. And so no one should be supporting asylum fraud, and yet that's exactly what this uh, administration is doing while they claim that it was the Trump administration that, that broke the asylum system. Uh, yeah. A couple more notes, um, if, if I may. Um, the Trump administration granted more asylum uh, applications in, in its first three years than the Obama administration did in its highest four years. Um, so, you know, the, the data does not support what, what Secretary Mayorkas claims um, and, and they're doing uh, irreconcilable damage to this, what I view as the second most important immigration benefit our country offers after U.S. citizenship. You know, when I'm when I'm talking to folks in the community, Laura, and I, you know, I'm telling them, you know, I've got law, I, I hunt with law enforcement guys, I, I, you know, fish with them, and, and they're telling me I got a buddy in Atlanta, you know, they're down over 400 officers. Uh, we met with uh, counterterrorism CPD and the sheriffs uh, a couple weeks ago, and, and their CPD is telling us they're down hundreds of officers. Um, all at the same time, crime is up, uh, incarcerations are down. Um, you mentioned a, a, what I call a tragedy and hope type scenario where, you know, you're going to just let everybody in through a porous border and then at the same time provide uh, millions, if not billions of dollars in treatment and recovery. Um, people are having a hard time seeing the logic uh, behind facts like that. And so the question is, why? You know, why would we just want everybody to come across the borders? Why would we want to decrease law enforcement and incarcerations at a time where we're seeing crime? Um, what would be your answer to why? It's for political purposes. Uh, some are ideologues and they just believe in open borders. Um, some view these populations as future Democrat voters. And some uh, want to skew the um, apportionment and therefore House districting in the U.S. House, House of Representatives. And some are all the above, but all of them will claim that they are doing this to help vulnerable populations. And if you dare question it, then you are a racist or, or worse. Um, in terms of the U.S. Census, the left was successful in keeping the question of U.S. citizenship off of the census. And so when it comes to apportionment or, you know, how many districts does each state get in the U.S. Congress, everybody is counted, whether you're a U.S. citizen a green card holder or an illegal alien. And so what that does is it skews uh, more districts to states like California, um, and therefore it's more power for the Democrats. Um, you know, that is a major reason for this. And as, as well as, you know, they, they're counting on uh, these populations to vote for them. Um, but, you know, we're seeing that's not necessarily a successful uh, strategy when, uh, you know, te Southern Texas is, is voting more Republican. 
um, because one, the left just views uh, Hispanics as, as a monolith, but two, they, they respect the family, they respect the law. You'll hear no bigger opponent to what is happening and to illegal immigration than legal immigrants that's right. who took the time and the effort to come here lawfully. And that's what's lost among all this is the U.S. remains the most generous country in the world for lawful immigration. And that's what we need to get back to is a lawful and orderly system. Um, this is completely disorderly. We cannot manage these numbers. Uh, and um, you, you never hear the left say, come here lawfully. You never hear the left say, go to a port of entry to cross into the U.S. Um, they, they just uh, condemn you if, if you dare question it or, or argue that it's bad policy. So, Laura, let's, let's bring this this home to Ohio and the and the Midwest. Uh, you know, we we had for for years uh, in Ohio been seeing a decrease in uh, opioid and, and and really drug induced deaths. Uh, you know, kind of peaked uh, towards the tail end of the the Kasich years uh, when when you know the the pharmaceutical companies were were you know giving out pills like candy on trick or treat, um, and we we seen those numbers come down consistently, um, and then you had a, sort of a perfect storm here of uh, COVID lockdowns and uh, Biden administration uh, immigration policies, and we're, we we've seen our numbers go up to higher than they ever were, sort of at the peak of the the uh, opioid crisis. Um, what can you know? And we'll talk about this a lot more on October twenty sixth when you're with us in Cincinnati. Um, but what can and should states like Ohio be doing uh, right now to uh, combat this? You know, we, we we can't set immigration policy ourselves. Our, our members of Congress can vote a, a certain way, but um, what, what are what are things we can be doing right now to to address this? Uh, a few things. One is is to continue to talk about in the media uh, and in the public about the fentanyl overdose deaths and how it is taking a, an entire generation of young people. Uh, it's the leading killer for ages uh, 18 to 45. It's about 300 people a day are dying from this. Uh, so one, it's talking about it. Two, it's putting pressure on this administration um, that these precious lives are being lost um, and, and connecting the dots for the public that this is happening in large part because it's coming across the Southern border, which is wide open and therefore getting Americans to put pressure on the administration to secure the border and stop the flow of these drugs. Um, you know, prevention is key. That's right. Well, Laura, we're going to talk about all of that and so much more. There, there's we, we could talk about, um, you know, especially the effort in Ohio that's going to be on the ballot in the next few, in either next year or 24, uh, to legalize recreational marijuana and what that would mean and and, and all of those things. But uh, Laura Reese from the Heritage Foundation, we're, we're so grateful uh, for all you do and for spending a little bit of time with us. Uh, looking forward to, again, October 26th. Um, we're looking to be at, we're gonna be in northern Cincinnati, kind of halfway between Cincinnati, Dayton. Um, gonna have It's going to be a free event for, I think we only have about 150 to 170 seats, a little reception beforehand. Uh, have a few extra special guests as well. Warren, Congressman Warren Davidson's confirmed. Um, even going to probably have a, a, a sitting U.S. Senator join us uh, as well. Um, look for those. That information will be up on ccv.org. Um, and we'll, it'll be a great conversation. And again, especially for the church listening to this conversation, this is a, one of those issues uh, that that a lot of times we we either hear a lot of times it's not a compassionate thing to have strong border policy. Um, but I think what you'll see is um, the the policies that this administration has brought in are doing more harm to families, to children, uh, to businesses um, than, than anything else. So, uh, Laura Reese, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll be back next time on The Narrative. Thank you.